All right, now we're going to start our second unit uh, talking about functions of several variables. So let's take a quick second to start off by reviewing what we already have seen before. So for functions of one variable, say take, for example, f of x equals sine of x, um, let's do something we've seen before and we're comfortable with. Uh, so what do we know about sine of x? Well, uh, its domain is from a negative infinity to a positive infinity. It could take any real number as its input value. Um, that could be written in either interval notation or using inequalities. Uh, its range is going to go from negative 1 to positive 1, because sine uh, will output from negative 1 to positive 1 inclusive. Uh, again, interval notation or regular uh, inequalities. Uh, we know that uh, for functions of a single variable, generally we write the input as the generic input variable of x. And the output we can write two different ways. We can uh, write it as f of x or y, which is oftentimes y. Uh, you'll see when we're working in, in the plane, the x-axis or input axis is typically labeled x and oftentimes the vertical or output axis is labeled y or sometimes y equals f of x or f of x like that. Uh, and when we're asking questions about the domain of a single variable function, typically that's it's it's really hard to answer the question what values are allowed to be input to a function because lots usually lots and lots and lots. So it's often easier to answer the question of what's not allowed. And in general, the problems, things that can happen is we could have division by zero and we have to exclude values that cause division by zero. Um, for example, if we're looking for the domain of one over x, well, x is not allowed to be zero because you'd have division by zero, set the denominator equal to zero and solve it. Um, the other thing, the other problem that arises oftentimes when we're talking about domains of functions would be uh, no negative numbers underneath the root. So if we have something like, sorry, it's pretty poor square root, that's a little better, x minus two. Well, then the numbers that we input into that square root have to be strictly greater than zero. And that's a fancy way of writing in math. Hey, it's not allowed to be negative. No negatives allowed. It has to be a, a positive number. And there's a quick oversight, so let's correct it. It's okay if it is zero, because you know square root of zero is defined to be zero. So we could be inclusive there to be true, accurate. All right, come on, come into focus. Sorry about that. Let's uh, pause this here for a second. All right, so that's a brief review of things we've seen before. So we're going to talk about these concepts, only we're going to apply it to functions of many variables. And in general, uh, while a lot of the concepts we're going to talk about extend to uh, greater than two variables, we're going to, for the purposes of this class, uh, primarily just talk about two inputs. Not always, though. So let's start by looking at a real valued function of two variables, say f of x comma y. So it's got two input variables, um, is equal to the output sine of x plus y. So we say this is a real valued because the output number is a real number. In our last unit, we saw functions that output vectors. Um, so this one is going to spit out a number, a scalar. And you can think of that output as, um, well, since our, well, before I read the second bullet point, let's take a look here. Well, our input values, OK, that's x and y. Well, we're kind of used to x and y here. And thinking of that as the positive x-axis. and that is the y-axis, thinking back to our last unit where we learned to kind of deal with uh, working in three space. You could think of this entire input plane here. Oops, sorry, that's not meant to be black. You could think of this entire plane, x comma y, all of the coordinate points on that plane as the inputs for this function. And so when you put a point from the plane into this function, you're going to take sine of x plus y coordinates of that point, and it's going to spit out a number, the second bullet point. It's going to output a number, a real number. And that number you can think of as the height above the x, y plane. And so there we're going to get involved a vertical z-axis. And just like we were saying before in the, in the introductory slide there, we typically label this axis z, but we could think of it as z is equal to the output of our function, which takes x comma y as its input. All right, so looking at this uh, function in a little bit more detail, uh, the inputs are going to be two real numbers, and we can think of it as a coordinate point. Um, it's written as x comma y for a reason. That co does correspond to the coordinate plane that we're used to working in. And the outputs are a real number. And we think of that as the z, the f of x equals 
f of x, y equals z, the output, the height above or below that coordinate input plane. And so now to answer the questions about domain. Well, what can go wrong? Uh, well, our domain is the input values here and x plus y, nothing can go wrong. There's no division by zero. There's no negative numbers under roots to worry about. And so our domain is gonna be uh, x plus y is equal to any real number. And any point in the x, y plane will give us a real number if you add the x and y coordinates together. So there's no restrictions on our domain. And so in this case, instead, of, we can't write it as like an interval, but we can just describe the domain as the entire x, y plane. Uh, so what is the range going to be? Well, sine of x plus y is always still going to be sine of any some number and sine outputs from negative one to one. And so the range, we actually can write an interval notation here. And if you look at that graph to the right, which is a graph of this example, you could sort of see that, hey, it's going to be a plane, sort of a wavy looking plane. And hopefully it makes a little intuitive sense that that, that wavy looking plane is never going to exceed the height of the height from negative one to positive one above or below the input coordinate plane. So let's take a look at some examples here. There we go. All right, so these examples that I've loaded now are just meant to be examples of kind of surfaces in space that we can look at. Uh, the first example I've got pulled up is the function that we were looking at. And only instead of being graphed the way it was in the slide, it's using GeoGebra. And yeah, as usual, you can kind of drag it around and explore things. And I've got the coordinate input plane there, as is the default um, showing. So you can kind of see, OK, those points are related to points above that. Well, and here's another example of another surface that we could kind of take a look at in three space. And then I won't, I won't do very much because I you know, these are links are posted on the site as well as the slides, and you can look at these on your own. But here's a nice thing to sort of explore as well, and a few different surfaces in three space that we can look at. Okay, so go back to the slides here. All right. So real valued functions and two variables. Here's another example of a function that we're used to using. Um, it's just sort of thinking in different notation. Uh, if I gave, if I put a, a cylinder on the screen and, and told you all the formula, everybody would be like, okay, yeah, the height is the vertical and the radius is like that. And the formula is the area of the base times the height since it's a, a geometric solid with vertical sides. But we could think of that as a function where volume equals pi r squared times height is equal to volume taking as its inputs are the radius r and the height h. And you could even relabel those with r is the radius and z is the height to kind of look more like our prior examples. OK, uh, so let's have a definition here. A real valued function in n variables. Uh, so the domain of a function that takes n variables as its input is just going to be the set of so-called n tuples of real numbers. It's sort of like uh, coordinates in more than three space, n space, if you will. Uh, f is a real fun valued function on this domain d. Uh, all that is is a math rule that assigns a unique real number output. So when you, yes, you're putting in n different inputs, but it's always going to, if it's a real valued function, it's just going to spit out a number. And oftentimes when we run out of inputs, w is kind of a common uh, output notation. So let w equals f of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. And then it has domain d, where the inputs are n independent variables, and the range is going to be the set of all w values. And notationally, the ranges uh, can be written as the function taking as an input, capital D, the set of all possible inputs. And we call, as usual, the output the depend dependent variables. So I mentioned this briefly on the introductory slide there, but when you're asking a question about the domain of a function, you shouldn't ask what is allowed, because again, so many different numbers are allowed. Really, it's an easier question to ask what could go wrong. And again, domain problems primarily come from no division by zero and no negative numbers under even indexed roots, fourth roots, square roots, sixth roots, etc. cetera. Um, why do I put even roots? Well, the third root of negative one is negative one, so it's okay to have uh, negative numbers under odd indexed roots. 
So here are some examples. Our first example, uh, we have f of xy is equal to the square root of y minus x squared, or alternatively, instead of writing f of xy, we could write that as z as, this is really kind of the same as saying, hey, f of x is equal to x squared, can also be written as the output y is equal to x squared, just replacing those notations. All right, so what could go wrong with this problem? Well, this one has an even indexed root, notably a square root. And so what we have to say here is we have no negative numbers under our root. And how do we write that in math? Well, no negative numbers under the root means that it's got to be zero or bigger, the set of all positive numbers. So we set what's under that root greater than or equal to zero and solve that to get our answer for the domain. And the domain ends up being, uh, in like conclusion, you would say, hey, well, the domain is going to be uh, y, all points on the on the coordinate plane, the xy plane, such that y is greater than or equal to x squared. Uh, the range, so I don't tend to ask very many range function range questions as a heads up to y'all, but it's helpful to kind of think about this. If we just say, okay, well, what kind of numbers can this function f output? Well, it's going to output the square root of something underneath it. Well, if you put any number under a square root, uh, allowed number, positive or zero number, what are you going to get out? You're going to get out a positive number. And so that means that our range is going to always be a positive number. So this graph is going to be strictly above the xy coordinate planes because the z value, the output value of all the input points is going to be positive. So let's take a look at our next example. g of xy is equal to 1 over xy. What problem could go wrong here? Well, we could have division by zero. We cannot have division by zero. You can't, x, y cannot end up being zero. So whatever you put in for x times y, it's not allowed to be zero. And in math, you write that as x, y is not allowed to be zero. Um, and that's literally, that's how we write the domain for this question. Um, and then let's take a look and think about the uh, range. Well, similar to why we understand that uh, in one variable, Let's see, one variable, if we have one over x, what's the graph of one over x? Well, it looks like this, right? Uh, it never ever hits the x-axis. It never attains the output, the y value of zero. And so for similar logic, one over x, y will never output zero. It'll always be above zero or below zero. And so we get that our range is gonna be z is not equal to zero above or below the uh, coordinate plane is the z outputs. And for our last example, h of xy is equal to sine of xy. Again, sine takes what as its input, any real number. Uh, in the coordinate plane, all values of x and y when multiplied together as our input here will give us a real number. That means that there's gonna be no restriction on the domain. It's the entire coordinate plane. Uh, to describe this, we would write that this is the xy plane. The entire plane is our domain. And the output sign outputs from negative one to one, as we've seen before. So z is going to vary between negative one and one. So notice here that the domain is a region in the xy plane uh, if the x, x and y are inputs. The range is a z value, the so-called height above a point on the plane. And let's look at our first example, f of x there. What does the graph of y is greater than or equal to x squared look like? Let this load here for a second. It's going to be the kind of the so-called interior of that parabola there. And what this means is if you could imagine a, uh, let's see, get some kind of a pen here. If you could sort of imagine some kind of a, a Z axis um, sticking straight out of this computer there, that surface, the, the resulting graph of this thing is only going to be defined above that blue input domain in the XY plane. All right, on to the next slide. So domain and range. Domain is a region in the x, y plane. If x and y are inputs, range is the z value, the height above the point. So what about when we include three variables? Uh, so in this case, it's common to write the inputs as x, y, and z, and then the output has w. So f of x, y, z is equal to w. 
In this case, our domain is going to be a region not in the plane, but rather three space, x, y, z space. And then x, y, and z are going to be your inputs. And the range is going to be the w value. And I haven't come up with a great way to visualize this, um, but it's really hard to visualize four space. We're used to living in three dimensions. Thinking about how we would visualize four space is pretty hard. But the range is going to be the w value, the output value associated with inputs that are coming from three space. Similar to what we just did on the last slide, let's look at a couple examples. f of x, y, z is equal to the square root of the sum of the inputs. And again, you're, what could go wrong here? You have a square root. You, uh, you don't want any negatives under the square root. So you set what's under the square root to be set to 0 or positive and solve accordingly. And that's going to be your, uh, your, um, your input. And so why, below that, do I have the phrase all of x, y, z space? Well, even if x is a negative value, when you square it, it's going to be positive. Even if y is a negative value, when you square it, it's going to be positive. And z negative value, you square it, it's going to be positive. So there's really, even though we have a root involved, we could put any numbers into that, and we will get a positive number under the root. So it's going to be OK. There's no restriction. Again, what's the output going to be? Well, it's going to output something that's greater than 0. So w is going to be positive, including 0. Our second example, f of x, y, z is equal to 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared. OK, there you've got division by 0. So you set the denominator to not be equal to 0. And then you've got to say, OK, well, what values are going to give this to me? Well, again, because you're summing up a bunch of squared things, you're going to be summing up positive values no matter whether the input is negative or positive, excepting if you put in 0 for either x, y, and z. So the only way you can get 0 out of that expression is if x, y, and z are all 0. So this function is defined for all of 3 space, excepting the origin 0, 0, 0. So let's think about the output here. Um, well, we've excluded that 0 point. So the output's always going to be 1 divided by a positive number. And so as a result, you're going to get an output that is not including 0 to infinity, all the positive values. Our last example is f of x, y, z is equal to x, y times the natural log of z. So for this part of our problem, x, y, sure, you can multiply any two real numbers together and get a real number. No problem, no restriction. The problem happens here as the input of a logarithm. We know that the inputs of logarithms have to be positive. They can't be 0 or negative. And so the domain restriction here is that z has to be it can't be negative. It needs to be positive and not zero. So it's going to be the upper half of space, if you will. The z values uh, above and all the coordinate plane points above that coordinate x, y plane. And so since uh, natural log of z uh, outputs from positive to negative infinity, think about the graph of ln. Whoops, let's get a marker here. I know it's a x, but just you know, call this z and think of that as the output axis. ln of z, the graph of the natural logarithm, looks something like this. So sure enough, it outputs from negative to positive infinity. All right. So let's do an example here. We've got our function is f of x, y is equal to the square root of x squared minus, I'm sorry, 25 minus x squared minus y squared. Again, our problem here is that we have an even indexed root, and we know that there could be no negative numbers underneath that root. So we have to take the input under that root and set it greater than or equal to 0. And when we do that, we end up with 25 is greater than x squared plus y squared, or x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 25. And if we were to plot this region, the domain is a region in the xy plane. And if we were to plot that, we would get the circle centered at the origin of the xy plane of radius 5, including the boundary, since it's less than or equal to. So this particular function is only going to be defined right above uh, that region in the plane, nowhere else above the plane. If you put in this point here, 5, 5, what's going to happen? Just for fun, we'll do it. 25 minus 5 squared minus 5 squared. What do you get? You get square root of 25 minus 25. No problems there. Square root of 0 is good. But oh no, when I subtract that second 25, I'm going to get the square root of negative 25. That's not a real value. That's a complex or imaginary value. So we can't have that as an imaginary value. Another example. Uh, so 
let's look at the first example we just saw a little bit more detail. Find the domain of f of x, y is equal to the square root of y minus x squared. Again, we've got no negatives underneath the root. So that's going to be, we're going to take the input underneath the root, y minus x squared, and say it can't be negative. So it has to be greater than or equal to zero. But before we go any further, let's just take a quick look at this graph. All right, load this real quick. And selected in green there, you'll notice, is the function we're talking about, f of x, y is equal to the square root of y minus x squared. And as we look at it, we say, hey, it sort of looks like this, this function is only defined above oh, what I would describe as, a, as a, some kind of parabola in the x, y plane there. So let's go back and see if we can do the math to, to justify that or convince ourselves of that. So doing that math gives us that y must be greater than or equal to x squared. And so our domain as a region in the x, y plane is going to look like this. And sure enough, we saw in that last slide that, that that function was only defined above this sort of region, this, this parabola in the plane as inputs. Uh, g of x, y, these are again, these are all the examples we saw in that original table uh, is equal to 1 over x, y. So again, we've got that open, but here we'd have the problem of no division by zero. So before we look at the graph, let's kind of just say, all right, well, what's not allowed here? When is x, y going to be zero? Well, if x and y are numbers that are not zero, positive or negative, it doesn't matter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a nice number. And so no problem there. And the only time we're going to get x, y is equal to zero is when either x is, not, x is equal to zero or y is equal to zero. So we have to exclude both those independently. Um, it is independent because uh, if you put in four and for x and zero and for y, that's no good. So it's not like they both have to be zero at the same time. It's that either one of them needs to be zero. So what does that look like if we were to plot that? So that excludes everything on the x and the y axes every time that either x or y is zero in the plane. So to plot that, you know, I didn't shade this in, but you can kind of imagine that this plane is, is shaded everywhere, as in this is your input, accepting those x and y axes. And that's why they're shown in red to sort of be excluded. I don't know, I thought red was a good choice of color there. And a dashed line to show that it's not included, it's not allowed. Uh, so before we proceed to the next example, let's go over to the, the internet and take a look at what the graph of this thing looks like. Turn off that one, turn on this one. And all right, here we go. We've got ourselves, hey, if you drag it from the top view, you can look right down and see that x, y plane and say, hey, yeah, definitely the x and the y coordinate axes are not defined. We don't have any output values. And, and hopefully, as you look at this thing in three space, you can see that the values run off to infinity as they uh, approach those values, because uh, we know one over zero tends to infinity. All right, next, let's see. Our next, our last example is going to be h of xy is equal to sine of xy. So what could go wrong here? And the answer is really nothing. Sine of whatever takes any real number as an input. It could take zero, it could take a positive number, it takes a negative number. And xy multiplied together for all xy possible values will give you a real number, so there is no restriction. The domain is going to be the entire xy plane, and as such, the surface should, quote, exist above or below any point on the xy plane in its domain. And the graph there is shown both on the slide, but also in, go ahead and click this because it's fun to do. Yeah, you got yourself a nice kind of wavy looking plane. Notice that sine uh, only varies between negative one and positive one. So if I kind of carefully position this here, you can see the height of this, plane, this surface uh, never exceeds negative one or positive one in the Z direction. Uh, that's it for those examples. So we'll close this down and on to the next slide. Okay, let's get you out of there. So how do we visualize functions of two variables? Well, one, uh, you could probably comes as no surprise I'm going to say GeoGebra is a great resource here, but sometimes GeoGebra fails us and, and being able to kind of sketch these things is, is sort of a helpful, actually oftentimes a very helpful skill. So how do we think about slash visualize functions in two variables? Okay, so as I like to do, let's start by thinking about functions of one variable. X values are inputs. The domain is the real axis, uh, the real number line, the X axis. Y is the so-called height above or below the input point, the X value. Y is equal to F of X. And so this kind of uh, is a quick graph to sort of 
emphasize that example. For any input x, you have the height above or below it. x comma y can be thought of x comma f of x, the output related to that input. Now, when we're working in three space, instead of having just a single variable as an input, you're going to have x and y, two variables as inputs. And we can absolutely, and sh you should think of those as points in the coordinate x, y plane in the domain. Z is going to be the height above or below the point. So Z is equal to F of X, Y. And what do we got here? We've got an attempt at a three-dimensional visualization of this, where we take any point in the plane and say, okay, X, Y in red there, you can see that's on that gridded plane, the X, Y plane. And the output, it's hard to read in here, but there's going to be X, Y, Z, which you can think of as X, whoops, let's get a pen here. The output point is X comma Y, and the output of Z is z is equal to f of x comma y. So let's take a quick look at that and see if the three-dimensional movable version is a little more clear to read. And again, as a reminder, all of these links are live in the slides if you wish to download them and check these graphs out yourself. But yeah, a little bit more clear here. You can kind of see, drag it around. Yeah, above that point is your output point. And there we can now read it a little bit better as well. All right, so how do we think about this stuff? Well, that's the same slide as the last time with the giant text at the bottom of use technology, but use it well. Think about what it means. Think about why things work the way that they do. So sketching 3D surfaces, while technology is great, sometimes it's not. So let's try and sketch f of x, y is equal to one minus x squared minus y squared by hand. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider cross sections of the surface for selected fixed values. And as a way to think about that, maybe we'll start by thinking about the coordinate planes. All right, so let's kind of give ourselves a little setup here. So I'm gonna approach this by sort of looking individually at the coordinate planes here. So let's, uh, let's start with the, well, the input plane. What is the x, y plane in three space? Well, let's give ourselves, a, to truly start, let's give ourselves a set of axes here off to, the, off to the left. Okay, as usual, z is gonna be our vertical and we're gonna think of z as the output f of x, y. Um, y is off to the right and x is kind of coming straight forward at us living with this uh, right-hand rule. Okay, so for x, the xy plane, how do you think about that in, z, in three space? Well, in that case, z is equal to zero. Well, this expression we have is really z is equal to one minus x squared minus y squared. So we're just gonna play a game of substitution here. We're gonna substitute z is equal to zero in to this uh, given equation. When we do that, we're gonna get, okay, zero is equal to one minus x squared minus y squared. Algebra that into shape. Um, and you get x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Now I should, I should really have done this in red ink. That was the plan. So I'll just draw a red box around it and a red line to emphasize that sure enough, we're gonna use red to graph this. Okay, well, we got our, our, very, our uh, planes labeled. So let's go ahead and give ourselves some tick marks here. Well, I know the punchline, I've, I've done this already. So I'm gonna sort of spoil it a little bit by putting some tick marks in here and saying, hey, one tick mark in every direction is going to be good enough here. So what does the graph of x squared plus y squared equals one look like in the x, y plane? Well, sure enough, that's just the unit circle, right? Okay, so I'll be a little more careful here. All right, if we're drawing things in three space, uh, the x, y plane is gonna be this flat plane here. So I'm gonna kind of draw the unit circle there. And then I'm gonna sort of extend it out here. And then again, I kind of know, well, you know what? I won't, I was gonna do dotted lines because I know the punchline here, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. Instead, I'm just gonna sort of do this. Well, why didn't I hit that? Well, remember the uh, x axis goes back there and there's negative one on the x axis. and the y-axis would continue and extend out there. And there's there's negative one on the y-axis as well. We're not worrying about the z-axis. We're just plotting this in the flat plane. Okay, so I've got my, that's what, if I were to slice this surface at the z is equal to zero plane, that's what I would see. I would see the unit circle in red there. 
So now let's take a look at the yz plane. Well, what's the yz plane in three space? Well, that's when the x variable is equal to zero. And so again, we're gonna play a game of substitution. Kind of disregard this red highlight there. Can I get that? Nope, not without deleting everything else. But we're gonna go ahead and substitute zero in for that. So what are you gonna get when you do that? Well, we're going to get um, z is equal to one minus zero squared minus zero squared minus y squared. That simplifies as z is equal to one minus y squared. Okay, well, if you're anything like me, uh, working with x's, uh, x's and y's is a little easier than y's and z's, but there's really nothing saying we couldn't kind of imagine what uh, this looked like. We could just say, okay, well, here, the y is gonna be our input axis and the z is gonna be our output axis here. And what does z is equal to one minus y squared look like? Well, that looks like an upside down parabola. And again, I had a plan to use a color. This time my color of choice was going to be black. So we're, we're doing okay there. And so at the height of one and then negative one and positive one respectively, this would just be an upside down parabola that's gonna extend down like that. So let's try and draw that over here in three dimensions. Well, here are our z, our y and z axes. I'm gonna highlight these in an absurd way so that I can easily erase this highlight. Yeah, all right, so those are the axis, axes we're after. Just pretend that x-axis is not sticking out. I'm gonna go ahead and say, all right, let's draw a parabola here. Notice I'm hitting the, starting at the z equals one, extending down and crossing at the y-axis z is equal to negative one. That's gonna go down forever. This one over here, it's gonna keep going. It's gonna kind of go down there and cross that y-axis at positive one, sort of go down forever. Yeah, it would sort of extend out a little bit more. Not a very good parabola, it doesn't go straight down, but I think you guys get the idea. All right, so now let's finish our last coordinate plane. Our last coordinate plane is gonna be x, y, or x, z plane, which is when y is equal to zero. So once again, we're gonna substitute y is equal to zero into the equation, and we're gonna get z equals one minus x squared minus zero squared, which is the same as z is equal to one minus x squared. And here we're gonna use blue pen for this one. And, and similarly, we would once again get a uh, x, z, we'd get ourselves uh, sort of an upside down parabola that's been shifted up by one. So now we're gonna try and draw this in our picture of three space over here to the left. Well, this part of my graph off to the right, sort of the positive x-axis is gonna start up here at z is equal to one, and it's gonna extend forward because it wants to go down. It's in this, this kind of slice, this plane of uh, zx, where y is equal to zero. Now, if I wanna go back here, well, this is actually gonna be behind the surface from my perspective. So I'm gonna use dashed lines here to say, hey, that, that that's gonna extend back to that negative one value, and that's gonna just extend down like that. We're gonna have the back of this. And so now maybe you can see why originally, since I knew the punchline, I wanted to go with a dotted line here for this, the unit circle. And now when we look at that, hopefully that looks something like uh, an so-called quote upside down paraboloid, if you will. So let's ask one further question here. Let's ask, okay, what happens when Z is equal to three? Okay, well, I don't know. Let's see what color haven't we used. I'll worry about colors later. All right, we've got three is equal to one minus x squared minus y squared. That's gonna be x squared minus, or plus y squared is equal to moving the variables to the left. Now I'm gonna move the constant three to the right. One minus three gives me negative two. Well, since these two values are always positive, there's no way that a positive number can be equal to a negative number. So this is undefined. Why does that make sense with the picture that we just drew? Well, I know this isn't to scale, but two, three on the Z axis, notice our surface doesn't ever extend that far up. Rather, it starts at positive one and then in the Z direction extends down below it. All right, now it's not on the slide, but I wanna ask us one more question here. So let's give ourselves a little bit more room here. Clear some of this out. Go ahead and write over here and say, all right, in orange, whoops, orange, not black, orange. What about, uh, well, we asked about z is equal to positive three, but looking at that graph, z is equal to negative three, 
something should happen there. Well, once again, substitute that in. Z is equal to one minus X squared minus Y squared. So replacing Z with negative three gives me Z, or negative three is equal to one minus X squared minus Y squared. Algebraing that into shape, I'll get X squared plus Y squared is equal to four. And that is a circle centered at the origin of radius two. So over here, imagine, a little hard to see because it's hard to visualize and hard to draw in three dimensions here. Again, not perfectly to scale here, but imagine down here I'm at z is equal to negative three. Well, if we were to slice this, uh, this paraboloid at that height, we would see an orange circle of radius two, right there at that height. And so this idea brings us to the idea of level curves. Well, let's see, let me, uh, let's, let's pause for just a second. All right, before we start talking about level curves, let's take a quick look at this plot in GeoGebra. So I tried to match the colors to what we just used on the previous slide, but uh, when Z is equal to zero, we had the X, Y plane be equal to zero, and we saw that we got a unit circle. If you drag it up from the top, sure enough, in the uh, X, Y plane with the axis oriented correctly, you've got yourself a unit circle there. And now when we talked about Z being equal to three, negative three rather, we would have uh, Z is equal to negative three. It's just a, a plane parallel to that X, Y plane, just at the height of negative three. And notice that it intersects exactly as we predicted with a circle centered at the origin of radius two. All right, now that kind of gets us a little bit ready to talk about our next concept, which is going to be level curves. Whoops. So what's a contour plot slash a level curve? Well, we just thought about a concept that we are familiar with, but we may not realize it. It's something called contour plots or level curves. If any of you have ever looked at a topographical map, even if you didn't necessarily know how to read one, you've looked at level curves. Uh, so when we fix z is equal to zero, we created a level curve, uh, which represented an, an elevation as a curve in the xy plane. And so this is exactly the same as a topographical map. If you were to, all those different lines that we see, um, let's see, this one in particular, there's a little, it's hard to read, maybe you can't read it, but it, it says 750, probably meaning that this thing is 750 feet above sea levels. As if you followed and walked exactly along this line, this path, you would stay at the same elevation. And if you walked up from it, maybe you'd be going downhill, maybe going, be going uphill. Actually, there's a 700 down here. So it looks like downhill lowers this direction and uphill is the sort of vertical direction from there. So level curves, topographical maps are really just maps of level curves uh, of elevation. Thinking of sea level as the XY plane, then the, the different Z heights are the different elevations above sea level. All right, so if we have a function f of x, y is equal to z, and we have some constant c, any real number exists within the real numbers uh, that is in the range of our, our function output, then we have a level curve. And that level curve for that real number c is the set of points that satisfy the equation f of x, y is equal to c. Think about this. What we did on that last slide is we said, hey, let z be negative three. Well, in this case, c is really just negative three. We replaced c with negative three, uh, or z with negative three, and, and did the math on the resulting equation. So what does this mean? We have an equation with three variables, x comma y comma z, but we replace z with a constant number c. That leaves us only with x and y, which we can think of and plot in the x, y plane, just being aware that it's going to be at that fixed z height in space. The curve that we've got will be, will show the portion of the domain in the xy plane that corresponds to the height z is equal to c on the surface. If you were to slice that surface with the uh, z is equal to c plane, the plane of height c. So here's a, an image of what this looks like. So again, function f of xy is equal to z, c a real number in the range of f, and a level curve for c is just replacing that z with c and then plotting it in the xy plane. And these different curves correspond to if we were to slice that surface at that height. Well, these are all the same color. And so I'm gonna add a little bit of color here and say, all right, this curve right here, this innermost curve, 
corresponds to this height curve right here. Now we're not given the uh, the equation for us or anything, so you gotta be careful. It won't always be that the innermost one is the highest. Sometimes the innermost one will be the lowest. It really, oh, that's not showing up very well. Let's try bright green here. Okay, and then green, this outermost curve is gonna be this, this bottom curve on that height there. If we were to slice at z is equal to zero. So sometimes when I do level curves, instead of calling them c is equal to zero, I like to call them what they actually are. This is actually equal to z is equal to 0 0.6. And this green one that I just noted, that green one is going to be z is equal to 0. This red one, I don't know. That red one looks like it's a little less than you know this height over here. If we were to imagine slicing this vertically, looks like it's going to hit that, that uh, got yourself a plane that's slicing this thing right there. Looks like it's going to hit it a little bit below 1. So I don't know. Let's, let's estimate that this says that the z is equal to 0.85 height or something like that. All right, so I've got a bunch of nice uh, resources linked here. Uh, we're gonna just take a second, open them up and have a quick exploration of them. And again, these resources are all posted on the site or in the links on these slides, which are active. So here's a nice, uh, animation of level curves. Uh, you see the level curve plotted in the xy plane at the base, and then the actual slice of height z is equal to, in this case, represented by k off to the slider off to the right. z is equal to 1.5 gives us the red height there on this graph. If you were to slice it at z is equal to 1.5, that's what you'd get. And if you were to collapse that graph straight down onto the xy plane, that's what you'd get. And if you drag this up, you can kind of See, let's see, that didn't work. Maybe I can use my finger here. All right, so this has exhausted the capacity of my um, tablet here. So I leave you guys to explore this, but this little slider off to the right does change the level curve and it's a nice thing to explore. Here's just another example, different surface, different level curves. Again, I'll let you explore that. GeoGebra here, here's a nice applet that I found. And uh, to see the note in the, in the slides there, if you zoom in or out, you can kind of reset things here. But notice as I drag this A is equal to four slider, you see that off to the right, you see the plane, the height of the plane that we're slicing it with, Z is equal to whatever value, generates a curve on that plane. And we then plot that curve just flat down in the XY plane. And if you want to change the function and it won't re uh, undo the level curves, just zoom in or out and it'll reset everything for you. There you go, zooming in or out clears the level curves plots. All right, we've got this um, revisiting this slide a little bit, noticing that off to the right, we can now look at this thing and say, okay, this is a contour plot that shows several level curves from Z is equal to zero. That's gonna be this outermost one, Z is equal to zero. That's this one down here at the base. Uh, all the way up to z is equal to zero. Well, where is z is equal to zero? Oh, whoops, I, yeah, z is equal to one here. In green relates to that level curve, which is just a point at, if you just slice the surface at z equals equal to one, you just hit that point right there. Um, and so this little guy, they have it as c is equal to one. But again, I like z is equal to one. I think it's a little more clear. All right, so here's a method for finding level curves. If you have a function that z is equal to f of x, y, first thing you do is for the level curve at a constant value, often referred to as c or k or some other constant, you set z is equal to that, you replace z with that, and it results in an equation that only has x and y in it, which we can then solve. Uh, if you like, if it's easier and possible, solving it for y might make it easier to graph in the xy plane, but you don't have to solve it for y. Uh, the examples we saw earlier, you know, x squared plus y squared equals four, that's a circle centered at the origin in the xy plane of radius two. Solving that for y would actually be harder. Um, graph this thing in the xy plane, label your curve with the height of the slice, z is equal to the number, and again, oftentimes, in textbooks is presented as c is equal to number, but I think z is a little more self-explanatory. And then you repeat that for various different levels, if you will, um, levels of z which at which to slice our surface to generate a contour plot showing various elevations 
plotted flat in the plane, just like a topographical map. So let's generate a contour plot for this function. f of x, y is equal to x, z. All right, so first things first, we're going to be told which plots to do. But before we progress, let's just take a moment and say, hey, remember, this is the same thing as saying z is equal to x, y. So if we want to find the contour plot where z is equal to 9, we're going to plug in 9 for z and then do the math. And we're going to get 9 is equal to x, y, and then y is equal to 9 over x. And then that's something that we can plot in the x, y plane that we know corresponds to the height z is equal to 9 in space. So let's start with, well, let's start with 0. Uh, substituting z for 0, you get x, y is equal to 0. And uh, when does that happen? Well, that happens if and only if we have either the y-axis equal to 0 or the x-axis is equal to 0. And so how do you plot y is equal to 0 and x is equal to 0? Well, x equals to 0 gives you the y-axis, and y equals to 0 gives you the uh, x-axis in the plane. And notice in green, right here in the center, I've labeled these as the level curves for z is equal to 0. So I don't know what the graph of xy in, in 3 space looks like z is equal to xy, but from this, this information so far, I know that if you sliced it at z is equal to 0, all you're going to have are two lines, and they're going to correspond with the x and y axis respectively. OK, so now. Let's do z is equal to 1. So you'll probably notice a pattern here. We're kind of working, started with 0, 1. We'll probably do 4 and, and uh, 9, et cetera, and then work our way through the negatives there. OK, so replacing z equal to 1, solving for y, you get y is equal to 1 over x. Hey, we've seen that. We mentioned that earlier. Notice I kind of labeled it there with z is equal to 1. Now I know that if I slice this surface at the z level of 1, I would get this shape. Similarly, putting 4 in for z and doing the same math, we get another sort of hyperbolic shape there. And then z is equal to 9, another one. And as we're looking at this, you can kind of imagine that if you were standing on this surface in 3 space, and if you were walking in this direction, I meant that to be a pen, not a highlighter, but a highlighter will work, you would be going uphill because that orange line of z is equal to 9, the blue line of z is equal to 1. That's going to be getting uphill in a relatively steep uh, manner. OK, so now look what happens if we start looking at the negative 1 values. All right, so I did these ones in dashed lines to uh, just differentiate them since I'm using the same colors. But we could also think of that as, hey, I plotted it as a, a dashed line because if, if I'm looking at this xy plot vertically straight down, then they, the z-axis is going straight up towards me, positive, and then straight down through the table in the negative direction. So this dotted line would actually be below the xy coordinate plane at that z is equal to negative 1 height. And I'll go a little bit quicker here. We'll get similar results for all of the other z is equal to negative 4 and negative 9, respectively. And I can see that if I were to stand on this surface and walk in this direction, I would be going downhill relatively steeply. All right, so here I tried to plot the actual level curve next to a graph of the actual surface. And, and you can kind of see that, sure enough, if I were standing, let's see, I'll try and use some colors here. If I were standing here, walk in that direction, then I would be walking, whoops, up like this. And if I were standing here, walking in this direction, that would be me going, oh, well, let's see, I think this is right, down like that. All right, so that was an example of how to generate a set of, a level, a set of level curves or a contour plot. And uh, we're going to go on to talk about, well, does this have to be done in the z direction? Well, it's, it's very commonly done in the z direction, but sometimes if you have to sketch a graph, like we did when we were sketching that graph from hand, we started to think about slices not only in the z direction, but also in the x and y direction. We could do this in any direction, but uh, vertical traces are sometimes defined. They're similar to level curves. Uh, we only consider the set of points where instead of z having a fixed value, we're going to fix a value of x or y. So for a vertical trace, Again, we have a function z is equal to f of x, y, and we fix x to be a, some real number, a. 
and then you get the set of points is going to be solved. You would substitute a in for x, so you get instead of f of x, y, you have a is a nice number, so imagine that was 3 comma y, and then you would input that into your uh, equation and you would get something that you could graph in the coordinate plane that's parallel to x equals a. And there are a couple examples here down at the bottom to look at. So for a specific example here, here's an example of the vertical trace for x is equal to three for the function f of x, y is equal to a sine of x plus y that we saw earlier. And notice here, you've got your x-axis extending this, whoops, pen, not highlighter, x-axis, and you can see there's a small y there, there's the y-axis. And so this line right here is gonna be, if you fixed the x is equal to three plane, well, imagine slicing this thing with the plane, x is equal to three here, what would you get? Sure enough, you would get just that line, that vertical trace through the surface. And if we were to plot that in the, uh, um, let's see, the YZ plane, it would collapse down onto that. So can we extend the idea of level curves to three, a function in three space? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, a lot on this one to read, but so again, let's uh, establish the setup. Now we have a function of three inputs. Sorry, I said that wrong originally. Can we extend the idea to a level curves to a function of three inputs? Yes. So f of x, y, z is equal to w. Three inputs, one outputs, uh, four total coordinates when we put it all together. So this time we're going to fix c to be a real number again. And just like we did before, instead of replacing the output z, we're going to replace the output w with c. And so you're going to have f of x, y, z is equal to c. What you're going to get is an equation with four variables where you replaced w with the constant c, leaving us with only an equation x, y, z, which involves three variables x, y, z. And that we can plot or think about. That's going to actually be a surface in x, y, z space. The surface in x, y, z space that, that, that corresponds, the input surface that corresponds to the output of w equals c. The surface we get will be represent the part of the domain and space that corresponds, yep, just what I said, to the fourth dimension of output w equals c. Sorry, sometimes my talking gets ahead of the slides. So now it's hard to visualize f of x, y, z equals w in four space, but we can visualize the level surface, the collection of input uh, points that relate to a specific output uh, value. So the method and process is very similar to that of finding and plotting level curves, only you're just working in four dimensions. So for example, finding the level surface for uh, w equals two or f of x, y, z is equal to two for the function x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus x squared uh, minus two x plus four y minus six z. Well, if we were to substitute all that stuff in, we would set that expression equal to two. So we replace the output equal to two. There we go. And then you need to complete the square a little bit. And if you do that, I did the, and I showed the colors there with the respective completions of the squares, if you will, you can put this thing into a nice, uh, nice format of a sphere centered at one, negative two, three of radius four in a three space. And so what this tells us is the, all of the input points, the inputs in X, Y, Z in space, all of the points on this sphere will give us an output equal to two when we put them into our function. And that's it for an introduction to uh, functions of several variables.